particularly welcome our speaker, Lord Martin Ries. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to talk to us today about a very interesting and most important topic, namely surviving the century. And I, I think and I hope that we'll learn how to survive the century. We're looking very much forward to your lecture. Now this topic, surviving the century, is particularly pertinent to our academy, which is based on two pillars. Learn Society on one hand, and the research performing organization on the other. A major task of our academy is uh, to play a mediatory role between science and society. And in this context, the academy keeps a close relationship to the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, the IASA, through the Austrian IASA Commission. The goal of this commission actually is in line with the general mission of IASA as well as the mission of our academy, namely to spread scientific results and innovation in the Austrian scientific landscape and society in a way unconstrained by governments, commercial organizations, and other interest groups, according to the motto of IASA, namely, science for global insight. I would like to thank Professor Kappert for his initiative in organizing this meeting and would like to ask him now to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Professor Deng. Thank you, dear Helmut. On behalf of IASA, welcome tonight again at this uh, second edition of the public lectures organized together with the Austrian Academy of Sciences. As already mentioned by uh, uh, President Deng, Austrian Academy of Sciences and IASA share many of the missions in terms of doing excellent science in support of the major understanding of the major transitions. YASA, as you know, has been uh, founded where the world was even more divided than it is now. It was in the 70s of last century. We had a former East, former West. And YASA was an institute which was put together to build a bridge, scientific bridge, between the divided world. That part of the world, which was divided then, is fortunately not anymore divided. But there are still many, many divides around the world. Divides in terms of the geography, geopolitics, but also divides about how we think about our future, how we think about sustainability, how we think about uh, how this planet would look like when it comes to the combinations of the humanity, anthropogenic influences, and the behavior of the natural systems. Looking for the solutions, we already came to a conclusion that we probably should not stay only with the classical sciences studying the Earth system. People who are doing climatology, like me, hydrology, mathematics of the evolution. And we are turning more and more to other disciplines who do understand other systems, systems which are outside of the uh, Earth systems which are in the uh, very far distances from the Earth, systems like the Cosmo. And one of the greatest thinkers of that category is with us tonight, Lord Martin Dees. If you read his CV, and if I would do it tonight, probably the lecture will not happen because only the number of honorary doctorates will keep me busy for half an hour. Uh, Martin is not only a great scientist, he has uh, many titles. He has been the uh, British Royal Astronomer and he has been uh, leading the Royal Society for, I think, almost 10 years until the celebrated 750th uh, anniversary. He is also a great protagonist of understandable science to the uh, people who are actually not scientists. Martin did an excellent series of the BBC. He wrote the books which are selling very well to the general audience. And Martin is uh, backing up the mission, scientific mission which YASA has to provide an understanding about the major global transitions. It is our privilege, Martin, to have you here tonight. 
I would like to invite you to stage to tell us about uh, your vision, how we survive this century. Martin Rees. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be invited by IASA to give this public lecture. It's also a pleasure to address a long-established academy. I'm going to be looking forward. Nonetheless, I'll start with a flashback to the 1660s, the early days of my own country's academy, the Royal Society. At their regular meetings, the Society's fellows peered through newly invented microscopes they heard travellers' tales. They experimented with air pumps, explosions and poisons. And some meetings were more gruesome. At one, there was a blood transfusion from a sheep into a man. And the man survived. <laughs> These men were ingenious and curious. But they were also immersed in the practical agenda of their time. Improving navigation, exploring the new world, and rebuilding London after the Great Fire. They were inspired by Francis Bacon. They were, in his phrases, merchants of light, but committed also to the relief of man's estate. Our horizons have expanded hugely since those times. No new continents remain to be discovered. Earth no longer offers an open frontier, but seems constricted and crowded pale blue dot in the immensity of space. But today's scientists have the same motives as these pioneers. The curiosity to probe nature's laws, the delight in ingenious devices, and the aim to improve human lives. But scientists can't now be polymaths. Research is now professionalized, arcane, and technical. There's consequently a barrier between scientists and the wider public indeed between different specialities within science. By the way, I'm using the word science in a broad sense to encompass technology and engineering. This is not just to save words, but because they're symbiotically linked. Problem solving motivates it all, whether one's an astronomer probing the remote cosmos or an engineer facing a down-to-earth design conundrum. The latter is at least as challenging point neatly made by an old cartoon showing two beavers looking up at a hydroelectric dam. One beaver says, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, my speciality is astronomy, and I'll start off with a cosmic vignette. This image is iconic for environmentalists. We've had it for 45 years. But suppose some hypothetical aliens were watching our planet for its entire history. What would they have seen? Over nearly all that immense time, 45 million centuries, Earth's appearance would have altered very slowly. Continents drifted, the ice cover waxed and waned, successive species emerged, evolved and became extinct. But in just a tiny sliver of the Earth's history, the last few thousand years, the vegetation and terrain altered much faster than before. This signaled the start of agriculture, and the pace of change accelerated as human populations rose. Then there were even faster changes. Within just one century, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere began to rise enormously fast, and something else unprecedented happened. Rockets launched from the planet's surface escaped the biosphere completely. Some were propelled into orbits around the Earth, some journeyed to the moon and planets. The aliens would have been amazed by this sudden runaway fever, occupying overall less than a millionth of the Earth's elapsed age. And if they continued to watch, what might they witness in the next hundred years? Will this spasm be followed by silence? Will the biosphere continue sustainably? And will an armada of rockets leaving Earth lead to pioneer communities elsewhere, on Mars, on its moons or asteroids? Some years ago, I wrote a small book on this theme, 
which I entitled Our Final Century? Question mark. The publishers left off the question mark. And the American publishers changed the title to Our Final Hour. Americans like instant gratification and the reverse. And there is a German edition too. And I got a new book updating these thoughts. My theme was that the Earth has existed for 45 million centuries, but this century is the first when one species, ours, has Earth's future in its hands. We've entered a geological era called the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene began with the advent of thermonuclear weapons. At any time in the Cold War, when stockpiles escalated beyond all reason, the superpowers could have stumbled towards Armageddon through muddle or miscalculation. The threat of global annihilation involving tens of thousands of H-bombs is thankfully in abeyance, though there is of course more reason to worry that smaller nuclear arsenals might be used in a regional context or even by terrorists. But we can't rule out later this century a geopolitical realignment leading to a standoff between new superpowers that might be handled less well or less luckily than the Cuba crisis was. We should, of course, acclaim the scientific advances which have transformed the way we live and enhanced the lives of billions. But we should also be anxious about the dark side of powerful new technologies which present new types of threat. I want to talk about some of these. For instance, our interconnected world depends on elaborate networks, electric power grids, air traffic control, international finance, just-in-time delivery, and so forth. Unless these are highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic, albeit rare breakdowns, cascading through the system. Pandemics could spread at the speed of jet aircraft, causing maximal havoc in the shambolic but burgeoning megacities of the developing world. Social media could spread psychic contagion, rumours and panic, literally at the speed of light. Malign or foolhardy individuals or small groups have far more power and leverage than in the past. Concerns about cyber attacks by criminals or hostile nations are rising sharply. Advances in synthetic biology, likewise, offer huge potential for medicine and agriculture, but they amplify the risk of bioerror or bioterror. And last year, some researchers who'd shown it was surprisingly easy to make an influenza virus both virulent and transmissible were pressured to redact some details of their publication. We're kidding ourselves if we think that all those with technical expertise to pursue such work will be balanced and rational. Expertise can be allied with fanaticism. The global village will have its village idiots, and their idiocies can have global range. So in a future era of vast individual empowerment, where even one malign or careless act could be too many, how could we safe be safeguarded? That's a real challenge. Maybe we'll need more intrusion and less privacy. However, the rash abandoned with which young people put their intimate details on Facebook and are acquiescent in CCTV cameras suggest that such a shift may meet little resistance. Those of us fortunate enough to live in the developed world fret too much about minor hazards of everyday life. Improbable air crashes, carcinogens in food, low radiation doses and so forth. But we are less secure than we think. It seems to me that our political masters should worry far more about scenarios that have thankfully not yet happened, events that could arise as unexpectedly as the 2008 financial crisis, which could cause worldwide disruption. And I look further into this crystal ball later in my talk. But let me now focus on two predictions we can make with some confidence about the second half of the century. First, the world will be more crowded. And secondly, it will have a changed climate, on average warmer. And these two factors will aggravate another class of the century's threats, the stresses we're imposing on the world's supply of energy, 
food, water and other natural resources. And this happens in complex, interactive ways, which IASA has led the world in analysing. And on population trends, Dr Wolfgang Lutz and his group have done wonderful work. This just illustrates population trends over the last few centuries. Rising to 7 billion today, and according to Professor Lutz, the best estimate is likely to rise to about 9 billion by mid-century. And this growth will be concentrated in the currently poorest regions, parts of Africa and India, which haven't yet completed the demographic tradition, transition. This is rather interesting. It shows the age distribution of the population in two extreme countries. One is Uganda, the other is Italy. In Uganda, high birth rate, short life expectancy. In India, the reverse. And countries are making the transition from the left-hand pattern to the right-hand pattern, but they haven't all made it. And the growth is mainly in countries that haven't made it. This uh, uh, distorted map shows each er a country's area by the growth in population over the last 20 years. And as you will see, it's in India and in sub-Saharan Africa that the growth has been greatest. And the resource pressures will be greater if these regions narrow their gap in the developed world in per capita consumption, as we surely hope they will. But there is some good news. Modern agriculture, low-till, water-conserving, and perhaps involving GM crops, together with better engineering to reduce waste, to improve irrigation, and so forth, could sustainably feed 9 billion people by mid-centuries. That seems the expert consensus. And other advances, especially in healthcare and information technology, offer grounds for hope. It's amazing, for instance, how fully mobile phones have already permeated even the most deprived parts of the world. But though we can, for those reasons, be technological optimists, it's hard not to be a political pessimist. There's been slow progress in improving the lot of the world's bottom billion, despite the moral imperative. And there's been still less progress towards the UN's other millennium goals. There's a depressing gap between what we could do and what actually happens. The population trends beyond 2050, going back to Dr. Lutz's picture, are far more uncertain. They'll depend on what people now in their teens and twenties decide about the number and spacing of their children. Hundreds of millions of women, especially in Africa, are denied such a choice. And enhancing the life chances of the world's poorest people by giving them water, primary education and other basics should be an imperative and an achievable one. But it seems also a precondition for achieving, especially in Africa, the demographic transition that's already occurred elsewhere and has allowed the population elsewhere to level off. What about the non-human share of the biosphere? Humankind's collective footprint is growing fast. We already appropriate about 40% of the world's biomass. And this ecological shock could irreversibly degrade our environment, leading to high extinction rates. We'd be destroying the book of life before we've read it. And biodiversity is a crucial component of human well-being. We're clearly harmed if fish stocks dwindle to extinction. There are plants in the rainforest whose gene pool might be useful to us. But for many environmentalists, these instrumental and anthropocentric arguments aren't the only ones. For them, preserving the richness of our bio biosphere has value in its own right, over and above what it means to us humans. That's a strong ethical now, all these pressures will be aggravated by climate change. And climate change is a topic I shouldn't bypass because it exemplifies a tension between the science, the public, and the politicians. The key fact is a simple one. 
the measured rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide. These measurements made by Keeling, father and son, in Hawaii over the last 50 years. This rise isn't controversial, nor is its attribution mainly to the burning of fossil fuels. Straightforward physics tells us that the CO2 build-up will in itself induce a long-term greenhouse warming. One degree rise if CO2 doubles. And this is superimposed on all the other complicated effects that make climate fluctuate. And incidentally, the up and down oscillation in this picture uh, is because there's more vegetation in the northern hemisphere than the south, and when the leaves fall off the trees in the autumn, that increases the carbon dioxide. It's used up again in the spring. And the rise is unprecedented over the last five million years. It's hit 400 parts per million this year, and uh, it's not been that high for at least the last five million years. But the direct greenhouse effect of the steadily rising CO2 is amplified by consequent changes in water vapor and other greenhouse gases, and also by changing cloud patterns. But these aren't so well understood. And the IPCC reports have always presented a range of projections depending on how much this carbon sensitivity factor enhances the blanketing of CO2. It's thought it gives about an extra factor of three, but that's not very certain. And of course, it's important that the mean temperature rise, two degrees, three degrees, whatever it is, is just an index for a warming that's very non-uniform and which induces complex changes in weather patterns, where the monsoons occur, where droughts occur, etc. And I note that IASA co-organized a big conference on climate impacts just last week. The science, therefore, is intricate, but it's a doddle compared to the economics and politics. Climate change presents a unique political challenge for three reasons. First, the effect isn't localised. CO2 emissions from this country have no more effect here than they do in Australia and vice versa. That means that any regulatory regime for mitigation has to be broadly international. Second, there are long time lags. It takes decades for the oceans to adjust to a new equilibrium and centuries for ice sheets to melt completely. And thirdly, it's uncertain, for the reason I've mentioned, just how bad the problem will be, just how rapidly the climate will change, and therefore what insurance premium we should be willing to pay. And there are other hard questions facing the policymakers. What balance should be struck between mitigating climate change and adapting to it? How much should we sacrifice now to ensure that the world is no worse when our grandchildren grow old? How much subsidy should be transferred from the rich world, whose fossil fuel emissions have caused the problem, to the developing nations? How much should we incentivize clean energy? And should we gamble that our successors may devise a technical fix that will render nugatory any action we take now? On all these dilemmas, there's not much consensus and still less action. But it's crucial to keep clear water between the science on the one hand and the policy response on the other. Risk assessment should be separated from risk management. And what's unfortunate about the climate debate is that this boundary has become blurred. There are some people in my country who think we should abandon our target of 80% cuts by 2050 if no other nation does. And to point out that we should more cheaply meet our intermediate 2030 targets by a dash for gas even without CCS, rather than by building wind farms. But this debate would be more constructive if, instead of rubbishing what the scientists have already achieved, those who oppose current policies recognise the imperative to refine the science and to firm up the predictions, not just globally, but even more important for individual regions. Well, what will happen on the policy front? My pessimistic guess is that global annual CO2 emissions won't be turned around in the next 20 years. And that means that the CO2 concentration can't be held below about 550 parts per million, which is getting into the dangerous range. 
But 20 years from now, we will know, perhaps from advanced computer modeling, but also from how much the Earth has actually warmed over that longer time base, just how strongly these feedback effects amplify the CO2 itself. We will know whether we are on the upper or lower of these trajectories for the warming rate. If the world is warming slowly, people will relax. But if the effect is strong, and the world 20 years from now seems clearly on a rapidly warming, warming trajectory into dangerous territory, there may then be pressure for panic measures. These would have to involve a plan B, being fatalistic about continuing dependence on fossil fuels, but combating its effects by some form of geoengineering. The greenhouse warming could be countered by, for instance, putting reflecting aerosols or dust in the upper atmosphere, or even vast sunshades in space. The political problems of such geoengineering may be overwhelming. Not all nations would want to turn down the thermostat equally, and there could be unintended side effects. Moreover, the warming would return with a vengeance if the countermeasures were ever discontinued. And other consequences of rising CO2, especially the deleterious effect on ocean acidification, would be unchecked. An alternative strategy would involve direct extraction of carbon from the atmosphere, making lots of artificial trees, as it were. This approach would be politically more acceptable. We'd essentially just be undoing the unwitting geoengineering we've done by burning fossil fuels but it currently seems less practical. It seems right to at least study geoengineering, to clarify which options make sense and which don't, and perhaps damp down undue optimism about a technical quick fix of our climate. But geoengineering, if it was brought about, would be an utter political nightmare, because not all nations would want to adjust the thermostat the same way. And very elaborate climatic modeling very believable climatic modelling would be needed in order to calculate the regional impacts of any such intervention. And that's why it's crucial, I think, now to sort out the complex governance issues raised by what's called solar radiation management, and to do this well before urgent pressures for action might build up. Next, some comments on energy supplies and security. This is a key issue in its own right, quite apart from the impact on the climate. The world depends about 80% on fossil fuels, gas, oil and coal, and spends several trillion dollars a year on energy and its infrastructure. But currently far too little is invested in developing techniques for economising on energy, storing it and generating it by low carbon methods. And I'd like to pay tribute to the massive global energy assessment that IASA published last year, which presents 41 pathways towards a low-carbon future. None easy, but all requiring action to start soon. It's surely in Europe's interest not to fall behind the Chinese or the Americans in developing technologies needed for a low-carbon economy. And what are these options? Wind is the most mature technology, but for that reason it perhaps has less scope for future cost-cutting. In Britain we're interested in wave and tidal energy. It may be a niche market, but our island nation has the geography, a big tidal range of fast-flowing currents that make it useful. What about biofuels? There's been ambivalence about them because they compete for land use with food growing and forests. But in the long run, Maybe GM techniques will lead to novel developments. Bugs that break down cellulose, plants that grow where nothing else does, or marine algae that convert solar energy directly into fuel. Another need is for improved energy storage. Batteries, supercapacitors, compressed and liquid air, etc. These are needed for cars and to complement unsteady power sources such as sun and wind. What's the role of nuclear power? 
I'd myself favour European nations having at least a replacement generation of power stations. But the non-proliferation regime is fragile, and one can't be relaxed about a worldwide programme of nuclear power unless internationally regulated fuel banks are established to provide enriched uranium and remove and store the waste at the end of the cycle. But despite this ambivalence, it is surely worthwhile to boost R&D into fourth generation reactors, which could be more flexible in size and safer. The industry has been relatively dormant for the last 20 years and current designs all date back to the 1960s. And of course, nuclear fusion, still beckons as an inexhaustible source of energy and is well worth the investment being made at ITER and elsewhere. But I think maybe the long-term option for Europe that's best is solar energy. Huge collectors in the sunniest countries of Europe, I guess not here and not in England, but southern Italy and Spain, maybe in North Africa, generating paths distributed by a constant wide smart grid. Achieving this would require vision, commitment and public-private investment on a huge scale, but I think only the same scale as the building of Europe's railways in the 19th century. Many still hope that our civilization can segue towards a low-carbon future without trauma and disaster, maybe via one of IASA's 41 pathways. But politicians won't gain much traction by advocating a bare-bones approach that entails unwelcome lifestyle changes. So the priority for all developed countries should be to implement first measures that actually save money, using energy more efficiently, insulating buildings better, and so forth, and to incentivize new technologies so that as fossil fuel prices rise, the transition to clean energy is less costly and above all to prioritise R&D into new energy sources, be they wind, tides, biofuels, solar or nuclear. But we shouldn't despair. It may take 50 years to decarbonise the world power generation, but IASA's studies show that if we start now, that's something we can do. Scientific forecasters have a dismal record. In the 1930s, Ernest Rutherford said that nuclear energy was moonshine. In the 1950s, the previous astronomer Royal in Britain said space travel was utter bilge. But as space is my special interest, I want to spend a few minutes discussing its progress and its prospects. And here, I want to go back to one of the first people to think about it, Newton, the greatest alumnus of my college, Trinity in Cambridge. This is a famous picture from the English version of Principia. It shows a cannonball being fired from a mountain top, and he calculated that for the cannonball to go into orbit, it would have to be fired at 25,000 kilometers an hour, far beyond what could be done in his time, of course. And as the older people here will remember, it was in 1957 that Sputnik went up. Four years after that, Gagarin, the first man in space, and only 12 years after Sputnik, we had the Apollo program of moon landings. This was a heroic episode, and I cherish this picture, uh, signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. The moon landings happened only 68 years after the Wright brothers' first flight. And had the momentum of the 1960s been maintained, over the next 40 years, there would certainly be footprints on Mars by now. But the political momentum was lost. The Americans beat the Russians to the moon, and that was enough. Since Apollo, hundreds of astronauts have circled the Earth in low orbit, many in the space station. But none has gone further. Manned spaceflight has stagnated, just as, for instance, supersonic flight has, Concorde, went the way of the dinosaurs. That's because there's no real motive. The practical case for sending people into space gets ever weaker with each advance in robotics and miniaturization. Here's Jack Schmidt, the last man on the moon, a geologist who spent three days walking around. 
And here's Curiosity, the robot that landed on Mars last August. It's trundling around Mars. Here's one of the views. And it may, of course, miss some discoveries that Jack Schmidt, with his jeweler's hammer, might have made if he went to Mars. But Curiosity is far cheaper, and it doesn't expect to be brought back to Earth. Indeed, as a scientist or practical man, I see a diminishing purpose in sending people into space at all. But as a human being, I'm an enthusiast for manned missions, and I hope that some people now living will indeed walk on Mars. They may be Chinese. China has the resources, the Dirigis government, and maybe the willingness to undertake an Apollo-style program that leapfrogs what the Americans did. But if others could boldly go to the moon and beyond, it's more likely to be our cup price ventures spearheaded by individuals prepared to accept very high risks, perhaps even one-way tickets, driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers, and the like. There are private American companies which already offer orbital flights. One of them, called SpaceX, is led by Elon Musk, who also makes Tesla electric cars. And the involvement of Musk and people like that with these projects is surely a positive step. And wealthy adventurers are already signing up for a week-long trip around the far side of the moon, voyaging further from Earth than anyone has been before, but avoiding the challenge of a lunar landing. I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not for the first flight, so maybe that tells you something. <laughs> and Dennis Tito, a former astronaut and entrepreneur, may not be completely crazy in planning to send people to Mars and back, again without landing. This would involve 500 days in isolated confinement. The ideal crew would be a stable middle-aged couple, old enough to be relaxed about a high dose of radiation. And also, there's a, someone who's talking about sending people on one-way trips to Mars. But whatever happens, don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. Space doesn't offer an escape from the Earth's problems. We've got to solve them here. Nonetheless, by 2100, there may be small groups of pioneers living independent from the Earth, on Mars or on asteroids. And whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish these adventurers good luck in genetically modifying their progeny to adapt to alien environments. And this might be the first step towards divergence into a new species, the beginning of the post-human era. And remember that the cosmos has a future as long as it's past. No astronomer could believe that humans are the culmination of evolution. Even though manned spaceflight has languished, unmanned space technology, of course, has burgeoned communication, environmental monitoring, and uh, uh, navigation. And of course, scientists have been hugely enlightened by probes to the planets and telescopes that have revealed mysteries of the remote cosmos. Most recently, ESA's Planck spacecraft, which tells us about what the universe was like when the entire universe we can see was literally that big. If I was an American, I would actually leave manned space flight to the private sector. And frankly, as a European, I feel that even more strongly. For historical reasons, ESA has a much smaller budget than NASA. But NASA spends only a third of its budget on unmanned programs. And if ESA were to eschew manned projects and focus solely on space science, robotic, and miniaturization, we could surpass the US in these endeavors, just as we already have in particle physics at CERN in Geneva and are doing in ground-based astronomy through the European Southern Observatory. The European Southern Observatory, incidentally, is planning to build this rather unimaginatively named the Extremely Large Telescope, the ELT, which will have a uh, mosaic mirror 39 meters across. That's probably twice the width of this room. And this will be able to detect Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. 
a wonderful and fascinating breakthrough. It will surely inspire huge public enthusiasm. Well, this was a self-indulgent digression into my specialist field. But let's return now to other futuristic technologies. The iPhone would have seemed magical even 20 years ago. So, looking 50 plus years ahead, we must keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to what may now seem science fiction. For example, human nature and human character have changed little for millennia. But before long, new cognition-enhancing drugs, genetics and cyborg techniques may alter human beings themselves. And that's something qualitatively new and disquieting because it could portend more fundamental new kinds of inequality if these options were open only to a privileged few. Indeed, some, like uh, Ray Kurzweil, think that intelligent machines will take over within 50 years. He believes in the so-called uh, singularity. And we are living longer, two or three years per decade. This is a graph of how it's going. And indeed, a real wild card in population projections is that there could be a really substantial enhancement in lifespan. This is still speculation. Mainstream researchers are cautious about the prospects of improvements that are more than incremental. But such caution hasn't stopped people like Ray Kurzweil, who's this great sort of a futurologist, who are worried that they'll die before this nirvana of eternal life is reached from bequeathing their bodies to be frozen, hoping that some future generations will take the trouble to resurrect them or download their brains into a computer. And the cut price version apparently is to have just your head frozen, not your whole body. I was once interviewed by a group of these chronic enthusiasts in California, where else? They were called the Society for the Abolition of Involuntary Death. And I said I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than a California refrigerator. And they derided me as very old-fashioned for saying this, a deathist. But what about robotics? Even back in the 1990s, IBM's deep blue computer beat Kasparov, the world chess champion. But progress is patchy. Robots can't yet recognize and move the pieces on a real chessboard as adeptly as a child can. They can't tie your shoelaces. But later this century, their more advanced successes may relate to their surroundings and to people as adeptly as we do. Indeed, let's hope that one day they can help us when we're old and frail. But moral questions then arise. We accept an obligation to ensure that other human beings and indeed some animal species can fulfill their natural potential. So what's our obligation towards sophisticated robots? Should we feel guilty about exploiting them? Should we fret if they're underemployed, frustrated or bored? And should we worry about another science fiction scenario? That a network of computers could develop a mind of its own and threaten us all? Well, these are all possible long-term threats. And that's why some of us in Cambridge, actually, both uh, natural and social scientists, plan to inaugurate a research program to compile a more complete register of these existential risks and to assess how to enhance resilience against the more credible ones. And this is surely an area where IASA could contribute great expertise. But coming back to the near term, it's clear that more and more of the issues that governments face, not merely these extreme risks, and futuristic scenarios have a scientific dimension, dimension. So now, more than ever before, governments need the best scientific advice to help them navigate the uncertainties. President Obama recognized this. He opined when he first took office that scientists' advice should be heeded, I quote, even when it's inconvenient, indeed especially when it's inconvenient. And he appointed John Holder from Harvard as his science advisor, and he is still hanging in there, even though others of Obama's dream team have moved on. For politicians, though, there's a problem with science advice, because the urgent always trumps the important. The local trumps the global, and getting re-elected trumps almost everything. 
But the big issues that I've discussed are either global or very long term, and they must be tackled internationally. <clears throat> to take one obvious example, whether a pandemic gets global grip may hinge, for instance, on how quickly Vietnamese poultry farmers report any stray sickness in their flock. And many of the issues involve multi-decade timescales, in other words, far outside the comfort zone of most politicians. And one question, incidentally, is whether we need new international institutions modelled on the IAEA or the WHO to cope with these other global long-term issues. Well, I've mentioned formal advice to government, but I think scientists can have often more impact, not by directly engaging with politicians, but by galvanizing the concerns of a wide public and the media. Because politicians do listen to the press and they care about a large post bag. And so I think scientists can help to lift long-term global issues higher on the political agenda if they act as independent scientific citizens. And here we have some fine exemplars from the past. For instance, the atomic scientist who developed the first nuclear weapons during World War II. Fated assigned them a pivotal role in history, but many of them returned with relief to peacetime academic pursuits. But the ivory tower wasn't for them a sanctuary, they continued not just as scientists, but as engaged citizens, promoting efforts to control the power that they had helped unleash. Hans Bethe and Joe Rothblatt were two among them who I was privileged to know. These men were an elite group, the alchemists of their time, possessors of secret knowledge. But defense and arms control to which they dedicated their efforts, are now a diminishing part of the agenda for citizen scientists. <clears throat> Climate, biodiversity, and the developing world now also have their high-profile champions exerting influence by involvement with NGOs or campaigning groups, by blogging and journalism, or through political activity. And we need more of them. <clears throat> scientists shouldn't be indifferent to the fruits of their ideas. And a special responsibility, I think, lies on those of us in academia or self-employed entrepreneurs, because they've got more freedom than those in government service or in industry. <coughs> and academics are especially privileged to have influence over the next generation. And maybe we should do more to sensitize our students to the issues that will confront them in their careers. Indeed, polls show that younger people who expect to survive most of the century are more engaged and anxious about these long-term issues. They don't dismiss them in the way that older people do. Well, I've run out of time, so let me summarize. We can truly, I think, be techno-optimists, but the intractable politics and sociology, the gap between potentialities of what actually happens, engenders pessimism. We need a change of priorities and perspectives, and soon, if we are to navigate the challenges of the 21st century, to share the benefits of globalization, to prioritize clean energy and sustainable agriculture, and to handle the Promethean challenge posed by ever powerful technology, and the downside of catastrophic existential risks that I've mentioned. And to tackle the interlinked global complexities, we need institutions like IASA, which has built up enviable authority, and an enviable reputation and transcends national boundaries. <clears throat> and I'd like to end as I began with a flashback to times even earlier than the Royal Society's foundation. We can draw inspiration from Europe's great cathedrals. There's St. Stephen's here, but some are even older, and I like especially to show this huge cathedral in Ely, near Cambridge, where I live. A building like this overwhelms us today. But think of its impact when it was built. This was built 900 years ago. 
Think of the vast enterprise of its construction. Most of its builders hadn't traveled more than 100 kilometers in their lives. Even the most educated knew of essentially nothing beyond Europe. They thought the world was a few thousand years old, that it might not last another thousand. But despite these constricted horizons in both time and space, despite the deprivation and harshness of their lives, despite their primitive technology and meager resources, they built this cathedral, pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Those who conceived it knew they wouldn't live to see it finished. And their legacy still elevates our spirits nearly a millennium later. What a contrast this is to so much modern discourse. Unlike our forebears, we know a great deal about our world and indeed about what lies beyond. Technologies that our ancestors couldn't have conceived enrich our lives and our understanding. Many phenomena still make us fearful, but the advance of science spares us from irrational dread. We know we are stewards of a pale blue dot in the cosmos, a planet with a future measured in billions of years, whose fate depends on humanity's collective actions. But all too often, the focus is parochial and short-term. We downplay what's happening even now in impoverished faraway countries, and we discount too heavily the problems we leave for our grandchildren. In today's runaway world, we can't perhaps aspire to leave a monument lasting a thousand years, but it would surely be shameful if we denied future generations a fair inheritance. And to survive this century, we will need the idealistic and effective efforts of natural scientists, environmentalists, social scientists and humanists. They must be guided by the insights of 21st century science, but inspired by values that science itself can't provide. And my final quote is from the great biologist Peter Medawar. I quote, the bells that toll for mankind are like the bells of alpine cattle. They are attached to our own necks, and it must be our fault if they do not make a tuneful and melodious sound. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Ries, for this uh, exciting, insightful, and uh, I think also emotional uh, lecture tonight. Um, we won't let you go like this. I think the house is full of uh, people having their own insights and expectations. So I would like to open for a number of questions. I do not know if we have some microphone moving around here. We do. So please, the floor is open for the questions. Even the real astronomer of uh, British society and UK government uh, is amendable for uh, questions which do not agree with this statement, right? So we can have also uh, uh, comments and not only questions. Thank you very much for this inspirational uh, inspirational lecture. I enjoyed it very much and in particular your perception about the new technologies and the role they might play. Um, I wonder whether you can also comment a little bit about technologies that are closer to hum human beings than the supply of energy and transport. Things that might not only change our behavior but also might diffuse faster because they're closer to us. So I just wonder what you think about that. Yes. Uh, First, let me say once again how much I admire all the work you did on your energy futures. Um, but of course, uh, uh, I did focus on big long-term issues. But of course, uh, um, it's hard to predict uh, what's going to happen in the future, even harder to predict the rate at which it will happen. And uh, uh, if we think of uh, mobile phones and uh, things connected with them, the uh, penetration of those into developing countries, the fact that within a few years, there were more mobile phones in Africa and India than there were toilets, uh, was an amazing development uh, with huge potential benefit. I think uh, uh, one can uh, 
uh, already see this tremendous benefit to the populations from the uh, awareness of what's going on and the fact that uh, um, farmers can't be ripped off so easily because they know market prices. Um, and so that's an example. Although I do think that um, uh, there's an interesting social science question which I alluded to when I said that if there was, say, a serious emergency in, say, Casablanca or Mumbai, would the fact that everyone had mobile phones lead to panic and rumours, or could it be used to uh, actually control things better? I think that's a really important sociological question. So that's just one example. Um, I won't venture uh, to comment on others, but of course uh, um, it is the everyday uh, benefits uh, which are important. And of course, as you say in your reports, um, quite apart from the uh, global uh, uh, need to save energy, we certainly want to uh, ensure that the poorest people in the world uh, can cook and heat them to their homes in ways that don't damage their health. So there all kinds of things we could do easily to improve the lot of the bottom two billion people in the world. Martin, um, you for sure know that some time ago, 15 years ago, some of the leading earth system scientists led by our colleague, your colleague, Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutzen, started to call this current era new geological era called Anthropocene. Yes. Anthropo Anthropocene, yes. meaning humans in their mass could exercise the force on the system comparable to geological forces. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, perspective of the scales of the astronomic proportions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even cosmology proportions, yes. do you believe that current some of the human influences actually can exercise a force comparable to the geological forces on the system Earth and outside? Well, it's clear this is the first century where uh, one species, ours, has a, had an effect on the planet. And as to what happened in future centuries, then uh, I think uh, uh, there has to be some sustainable life on this Earth. But I do suspect that there will be uh, groups of crazy pioneers who will move away from the Earth, and uh, they will um, uh, eventually develop into new species, etc. So, uh, from the point of an astronomer, then the Earth is less than halfway through its life. The sun's been shining four and a half billion years. It's taken four billion years for the simplest life to evolve into us, but it'll be five or six billion years before the sun flares up and engulfs the inner planets. And so, any creatures to witness that event won't be human. They'll be as different from us as we are from a bug because there'd be as much time for evolution. And I would strengthen that further because the evolution in the future is not going to be on the Darwinian time scale of natural selection. It's going to be on a much faster time scale of technology. So the post-human era, if people start moving away from the Earth, could start within a few hundred years, not a few million, by new technology. And what is unclear is whether the post-humans will be organic, whether they'll be silicon-based. We don't know. Thank you. Yes. Mm. Thank you. You didn't mention the solar power satellites as a future possibility. Oh. It was Peter Glaser, I think, and Arthur yes, C. Yes. Little who had this idea first. Yes, yes, yes. The great privilege to uh, meet uh, Dr. Ortner, who I knew for many years when I was involved in ESA. Um, uh, no, I, I certainly think solar energy on the ground is very important. And uh, solar energy in space, of course, uh, uh, could be very efficient. There's a problem of getting it down safely via microwave uh, beams to the Earth. But uh, I, if we think about the future of space technology, even though I'm pessimistic about the need for humans, I do think that uh, there will be uh, robotic fabricators so that large constructions can be made in space, perhaps using material mined from the asteroids. And it may then be possible uh, to build very large mirrors in space, and uh, they could be used, uh, um, as I mentioned, as shades to cool down the Earth, but they could also be used as huge mirrors to generate solar energy. So it's just a question of cost. I mean, now, of course, that's too expensive, but I think if we have uh, uh, robotic fabricators and can mine material from asteroids, then that may eventually be what happens. Yes, please. Asta. Uh, Martin, <clears throat> I'll 
bio argument about uh, <coughs> new technologies. But you have not addressed one point. Who are the people who are going to be living 200 years, not 1,000 years, 200 years from now, <coughs> the composition of the world? Uh, I've often said, and you know that, that the world should be divided into a geriatric and a pediatric one. And the geriatric world is Europe, for instance, that is Austria, Europe, <coughs> Japan, and soon also China, one-fifth the world's population. Uh, so you're talking about right now societies that have 20% of the people above the age of 65, at the rate at which <coughs> population is diminishing or rather increasing in those countries, which are precisely the ones that are creating the two, two technologies. By the end of this century, you'll have some countries that already have 35, maybe even 40% of the people above the age of 65. So it's not just a technological question, it's really a <clears throat> sociological, cultural one to bring up people and tell them what they're going to have to do during the last quarter of their life, instead of considering that they're going to retire. It has to be a completely different life. And that is extremely difficult to institute. Absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, um, Dr. Lutz's projections um, do take account of these, uh, uh, these regional effects. And I agree that uh, how we handle the aging population is something which the Japanese have to think about already, and the Italians, we all will. But if you look more than 100 years ahead, then, of course, what we don't know is to what extent healthy life will be extended, and also to what extent people will move between different regions of the world. Uh, and so things may homogenize in some respects. But I completely agree that uh, um, for those reasons and the others you've addressed about uh, re reproduction being different, uh, we will have to bring social scientists into all our predictions because uh, the sociology is going to be hugely different when we have this different kind of society. Ladies and gentlemen, let me use this opportunity, if I may, Martin, to introduce to you yet another great, one of the greatest minds of last century and this century. He's with us tonight, Karol Gerasi here. Karol Gerasi, one of the biggest biochemists of last century, Austrian, American, British, everything. We are so privileged to have you tonight with us. Let's give a big hand. Karl is the world's greatest benefactor of womankind. That's right. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, the human biology and uh, about the this dilemma between uh, growing population and uh, environment. Um, on, on one hand, we have this uh, problem with growing population, hum human population in the world, and this affects on, on uh, environment. Uh, on the other hand, we need to produce uh, a larger offspring so that um, we can keep our population fit. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad fact about our biology. Um, do you think, is it going to be necessary in the future to use genetic engineering and alteration of human genome to keep the population fit um, unnaturally? Because, I mean, what I mean is the accumulating mutations in human genome with, uh, through time uh, or in, in any other species is eliminated by natural selection because uh, the um, do you think, is it going to be necessary to eliminate these mutations by, by, uh, by changing our genome in the future? Uh, well, I'm not expert enough to comment on that. I mean, this is being done in extreme cases already, and uh, it's a technical question and an ethical question how far that can go. But just as a byproduct, you, you talked about present population, and uh, let me just make a point I forgot to make in my talk, which is that... Um, when people talk about an optimum population for the world, this is rather naive because it depends on projecting the lifestyle of people in 2050. Clearly, if people want to live like present-day Americans, then even two billion people is too many for the world. Whereas if we were to uh, live in little capsules, eating just rice and living in virtual reality, then the world could support 20 billion people. So that's why we can't, uh, without projecting what the uh, technology and the sociology would be, say what we want the world's population to be. But when we have it, then of course the other question would be to what extent we use genetic technology to modify the nature of the individuals in that population. Any more questions?
question. Martin, let me then uh, finalize with one very general question, which of course is too general for scientists, but let's, let me ask it. You have been uh, advising major governments, major leaders of this world, talking to them, going around, discussing the issues of uh, global transitions, and standing always on the side of uh, we need uh, action, we need uh, to think about how we proceed to a more sustainable, more robust world. And we know, you know, I know, we all know that we are not successful as yet communicating this message to the policymakers. And YASA, which I'm representing here, of course, is supposed to do it as well. And we are doing our best, but as you've shown us this evening, we are on the path which is not yet sustainable. If you would have, from now on, 500 billion US dollars at your disposal every year for the next 10 years, what would you do with it to instigate change? What is your priority? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, well, I just mentioned two things. First, obviously, to uh, improve the lot of the bottom billion, the really poorest people, which you could do quite, uh, you could do quite a lot. In fact, they, the 100 richest people in the world by themselves could do a lot in that, in that direction. So clearly, we want you to do something there. But also, I would uh, uh, do a lot more research and development in energy, because uh, it's anomalous that the amount of work being spent, time, money being spent on research into new energy is much, much less than the amount being spent on, say, medical research. And it's equally important in the long run. And I mentioned that uh, uh, nuclear power stations were being now built on designs going back to the 1960s. And I think I would uh, invest into R&D, into all possible sources of uh, clean energy, nuclear, fission and fusion, um, uh, biofuels, and uh, solar, and uh, on the ground and in space and all these others. So I think those are the two investments I would make. One, an immediate short-term ethical imperative, and the other, I think, uh, a more efficient way to ensure that we get things right in the long run, energy-wise. You will understand this is for YASA Director, a very welcome message. Thank you, for, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, big hand for uh, Lord Martin. <laughs>
There is a little reception downstairs uh, where you can uh, ask questions or come at you.